It's big, it's red, and it's fucking overpriced. This is the Gravis Ultrasound. Well, hello everybody, I'm High Treason. You already know what this video is about. I'm not even asking the question this time, I'm telling you, it's overrated. Let's have a look at why. Probably didn't need an introduction, you most likely heard of this card, but maybe haven't gotten to use one because they cost a lot of money now. They weren't so costly when I got mine, nobody seemed to want them quite so much yet, and they could still be found for double figures if you were patient and knew where to look. Advanced Gravis were a Canadian company founded in the early 1980s, but good luck finding anything they made from back that far, really anything before this card. Supposedly their focus was on game controllers, so we can probably all guess what these things looked like and what they probably did anyway. More than likely isn't worth paying much mind and just focusing on this sound card, because, well, other than some gamepad that I didn't really think was remarkable because it was like every other gamepad. This card's really the only noteworthy thing they ever did. So, as for this card, the Ultrasound, it was released in several versions over time, but I only have the original or the three point odd revision of the original. The earliest cards came out from October 1992, which places them in the same age range as other 16 bit sound cards, such as the Sound Blaster 16 from four months earlier in June and the Pro Audio Spectrum 16 from May. Like those, the GUS uses a 16-bit ISA interface, and it offers 16-bit audio, and it can do so at sample rates of up to 44.1 kHz, which generally we would call CD quality audio. I mean, this is to say it can mostly do CD quality audio. Recording capabilities aren't even worth thinking about short of using a daughter card that I don't have and I've never seen one in use, although I do know they exist. Maybe this is testament to such features rarely being used and the card's cost been reduced by not including such hardware, but I don't know about that. I mean, buying that might have just been too cost prohibitive for people who wanted it so they didn't bother. That's also possible. Furthermore, the playback quality will drop depending on how the card has been used, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. You know, let's just address the elephant in the room. I mean, they called this damn thing an ultrasound, and no matter how many times I look at it, I can just never shake the connotation that ultrasound to me is a thing that you prod women in the stomach with to see if there's another human being growing in there, or a thing that you have, like, pasted about your testicles. I've had that done, it's a bit of a weird experience, I mean, you know, they, they put all this lubricating gel all over the place, and they have this little thing, almost looks like a barcode reader, and it, it's always really warm, and they're, they're like, scraping it along your goddamn ball bag, and there's some nasty doing it who looks half decent, you, you can't like, you know, I'm surprised, like, would they not get a male to do this, and oh well, we can uh, rebook you and uh, get you a male to perform this if you, you feel more comfortable, it's like, why the fuck would I want to do that? No, you carry on. <laughs> I have no complaints about this. <laughs> Seriously, though, it's a bit of an odd choice of name, really, when you think about it. So maybe they didn't think that through, but hey, whatever. I guess it doesn't really matter what it's called, as long as it works, right? Right there is the GF1 chip, which really is the heart of the card. To all intents and purposes, it's just a primitive 32 voice sampler, so it can play and mix samples in hardware, because it's nowhere near as capable as, say, like an Akai S series, but it'll get the job done. This chip does the bulk of the work, because it has to, it has no choice, there's no audio codec on board, and so there's no streaming audio to it, everything has to be handled as a sample, for better or worse. To store those samples, you need RAM. This is provided by up to 8 DIP DRAM chips in the corner there, the same type used by old video cards. You can install a maximum of 1 meg. Strangely, the cards have pads for two SOJ chips, but they're never populated as far as I can tell, which is a shame because two of those would be a far more convenient option, and to be honest, might have been a faster form of RAM. Maybe this was related to costs, I don't really know. I think some later versions of the cards used them. 
Not to mention increasing the limit for how much RAM you could install, but this seems largely pointless as I've never run into an application that wants more than the 1 meg on this so-called classic version of the card, which is really a retronym, it was just the Gravis ultrasound until the other ones came along. Unless you're writing your own stuff for it, there probably is no reason to have more than 1 meg on the card. Many applications will work with even less. This version of the card offers no CD interface, but it does offer CD audio headers in Sony and what I think is Media Vision's old style. At the back you have the regular ins and outs, including a line out that allows you to bypass the amplifier. The card offers no PC speaker pass through of any kind, which is unfortunate. More cards really do need that feature. We'll be using this PC today, it's a Pentium Overdrive 133 with 16 megs of RAM and a Peacock Movie Media. It's a bit of an oddball machine, but it does work mostly, so, well, it's what the card's installed in, so it'll have to do. And this is where things take a turn for the worst. I have never, not once, had the driver installation for this card go smoothly. The installer is completely crap, prone to throwing up errors that don't exist, and later, prone to crashing the system. This is not to mention the fact that a decent chunk of the settings tend to be ignored. That is, you will set them and the installer will just act like you did nothing and do things its own way. Assume it'll let you set them anywhere without giving you some false reason that you can't use a given option. I don't want SBOS to run by default. SBOS I set it not to, but the installer put it there anyway and added it to my auto exec, so now I have to manually get rid of it. So now you, we have the card set up and eating memory. What shall we do next? Well, I guess we could run some games. Ah, well, there's our first obstacle. Assuming we did get this far, as I've had the card flat out refuse to run in some systems. To the point where you can't even complete its installer. But whatever. Not all that many games really support it, and even fewer support it properly. In 1992, the card didn't have much support at all yet. Though that's fair enough, as it was a new card, and that tends to happen. Not that this deterred Gravis from promising things which weren't really delivered on. In all fairness, not many games supported the Sound Blaster 16 yet either, but that card had the advantage of backwards compatibility. The Pro Audio Spectrum was much the same, it at least offered Sound Blaster compatibility in some capacity. The Gus claims to have the Sound Blaster Pro compatibility via software, and, well, that's a bit of a problem because it is done in software, and that software is rather poor. There are two options at your disposal, SBOS and Mega M. The latter can be forgotten about, because I've never known it to work. Typically it just crashes, does nothing, and, well, this should allow access to the uh, MPU emulation as well, but I've never been able to get Mega M to do anything much. So, like I said, forget about that. The other option, SBOS, is a total mess. For one thing, the card has no FM chip, so it has to emulate one using samples, which never ends well. To be honest, I don't think there's any conceivable excuse for this on an ISA sound card, short of studio cards that explicitly stated they weren't for running games and made no attempt at compatibility at all. But even then, Media Vision had OPL3 and Sound Blaster compatibility on their studio card at this time, and it's not like FM chips were particularly expensive anymore. So, well, why Gravis couldn't really put either feature on their game-oriented card is baffling, and to be honest is utterly stupid. Frankly, I cannot forgive it for this. I think it was a retarded decision. I think it was ridiculous. No need for it. And you can't even make the argument that, well, maybe the Gus was meant as a studio card, because that requires an expensive optional accessory, it can't do that out of the box. Put it this way, in 1992, there weren't even that many games using sound cards for anything other than their FM chip to play music. Obviously we're going to stick to games you all know, because there's a reason you all know them. They're games that people were playing, and that are still worth playing. I'm sure there is a game out there that sold like 10 copies, that would show this card in a much better light, but only five of the people who bought it even remember it, and even then it's quite vague and they can't quite be sure it wasn't just some drunken delusion they had 20 odd years ago. So here's Cosmo's Cosmic Adventure, because I always end up using this to test OPL2 noises now it seems. No 
not very good. Also, no PC speaker pass through for sound effects. I'm not a fan of that. I really wish it had that. A lot of cards don't, but I mean, they're kind of have an excuse. I mean, if Gravis can skimp on FM chips and Sound Blaster compatibility, I guess everybody else can skip on these little PC speaker headers. It's really easy and cheap to implement, so I don't know why so many of them didn't. The trend of this crappy compatibility continues. Sounds like something N-Sonic would have made. They're an abomination of a sound card wasn't out for another two years yet. Still, some people seem to think that Gus uses a chip which was derived from N-Sonic's keyboards. And whilst I can't prove that, I'd seriously believe it because N-Sonic's gear is fucking useless. much you like this card because it totally fails when used for this particular application and that's a big deal for the time it was released because this is almost certainly the type of thing people would have wanted to use a sound card for and i know what you're going to argue and i shall address it later mark my words it would really be a while before native support made it to any of the big name games but certainly such an obligatory game is doom yeah crap i forgot another tsr it seems so yeah, Doom, which is loading right now, I promise. You'd never think this machine had a fast hard drive, would you? But that's more like it. Whilst it certainly isn't the best showcase of the card, it does at least not rely on any emulation. The sound is stereo, and it's clear, and it's noisy. Yeah, unfortunately the noise floor is quite high on these cards, and that's on the unamplified output. I've heard it's better on some versions and different revisions, but the one I have is noisier than the Sound Blaster 16, which was already a noisy card, so that's pretty poor. Unfortunately, Doom 2 would be the end of support from id's games, as Quake only runs on Sound Blasters. Not that Doom really supported that many cards itself anyway, compared to some other games. And to be honest, I can't really be bothered with either of them. Duke Nukem 3D has ultrasound support, so that's something. But I sure seem to be waiting an unusually long time for things to load. It must be my imagination. I mean, the boot screen and the level loading always took this long, right? It, it's, it's not just me. And they always had this much disc activity. Unfortunately, this is where the problems begin again, because sounds like these tend to come out of the card. There are ways around this. Disabling sound will eliminate some of them from the music, but not all. 
And so the only thing left to do then would be to disable the music. Which isn't great when the only way to fix a sound card is to turn it off and have no sound at all. I suppose Apogee's audio system was always a bit dodgy though, so maybe that's it. We'll give it a far chance. Gravis seems to have had a focus on tracker music, so maybe we ought to use a game which uses tracker music. I mean, it's ideal really. Load the samples into the GF1's RAM and let the chip do the rest. Unless you want effects, as there's no effects unit on there. Mixing and playback should largely be done in hardware though. The GF1 is certainly capable of that kind of thing. Terminal Velocity is a good game, and it uses tracker music. Oh great, those noises again. These will show up if you have bad RAM on the card, but I've tested the RAM extensively both with the card's utility and by swapping it with known good RAM from video cards. It doesn't help and the crunches still persist. There's a fix, but it's not pretty. There are a good number of supported titles that exhibit this issue, and it can often be abated by setting the sound to mono, turning down the sample rate, or turning aspects of the audio off. Sample rate is its own problem anyway, because when I said the card can do 32 voices, I wasn't lying, but those voices come at a cost. The maximum sample rate decreases as more voices are played, until it's less than half the maximum at around 19 kilohertz. So why is this thing meant to be better than the old 8-bit sound blasters again? At least those will give you a steady 22 kilohertz in stereo. Even the old sound blaster 2 can do 44 kilohertz mono fairly consistently if you really push it. There's also another problem, I wasn't imagining those load times. Every time a bunch of new sounds want to play, the samples have to be uploaded to the Gus's RAM, and can't simply be DMA'd to a looping buffer, like playing sound on most other cards, i.e. the Sound Blaster. Unfortunately, this process is quite slow and produces noticeable load times, and even stalls when running games. The same can be said for playing songs, where the instruments have to be uploaded to the Gus's RAM beforehand, and sometimes these don't get there fast enough from garbage players. It isn't like most wavetables that either preload all of the instruments at boot time or call them from ROM. Worse still, a good many games don't even seem to bother supporting the card properly. They seem to do things like mixing in software. Whether they do or not, things certainly perform worse, and I can see noticeably higher frame rate in many places when using a more conventional card like a Sound Blaster. And that's actually a shame, because whatever advantage the GF1 might offer by doing things in hardware has just been negated here, and the card's actually hurting performance rather than helping it. It kind of goes against the whole gimmick, really. The stock instruments for MIDI are a little weak. They don't have that much punch about them, but they are at least serviceable. I'd certainly rather listen to these than what you'd get on an N-Sonic card. However, it's quite possible to break this by switching to another MIDI too quickly for the instruments to loading time, which quite often stops them loading at all and causes the wrong instruments to play. I'm not sure why we can't just load all of them at once. I mean, plenty of cards could do that in 512K and actually sounded better than the Gus. But then the Gus can't handle any compression, so maybe that's why. There is a potential advantage, because as the instruments aren't stored in ROM, you can change them as you wish. But this is tedious to do. 
It does seem someone made another set though at some point, as a lot of Gus recordings on the internet use a different set of instrument samples than the ones which came on the original floppies. Unfortunately, I think this set is actually worse because it seems to try and act like it has effects when it doesn't, and it just sounds a bit crap. So for me, I'll stick to the original set that came on the driver floppies. But to each his own, I mean, the card gives you the option, so hey, why not? I do think the Maui is better though. It has a similar set of instrument sounds to the Gus's original ones, but they're way more punchy and the card only serves as a MIDI device. Probably better to get one of those and pair it with a more conventional card if you want something that sounds like a Gus for MIDI playback, but actually want to have sound and not a fuck ton of slowdown going on in your games. Furthermore, the Gus is useless in Windows. Oftentimes the drivers won't work, especially in Windows 95. In fact, I'm not confident saying it ever really had Windows 95 support. It's not like it appears in the device manager, it just, you had any files. You'd have to go in those if you wanted to tamper with it. The card really is about the only reason I have Windows 3.1 on this machine, as I did want 95 on here, but the card just wouldn't work there. Even then, the Gus driver has phantom issues and it likes setting its parameters to those that the card isn't using. Which is another issue, as it's surprisingly hard to find a comprehensive list of jumper settings for this version of the card. You don't even get a proper mixer or anything in Windows, absolute jibs. The Gus has one ace up its sleeve though, not to be confused with the ultrasound ace, and that's demos. The card was popular on the demo scene due to its ability to offload a far part of the module playback to the GF1. There exist many demos that don't even support any of the card, and Cena's did make extremely good use of it. Where other cards were supported, you can quite often hear a vast improvement when playing the demo back on the Gus bar.
is well suited to this task, as demos are linear, they simply set up the music and let it play. You have no control other than starting or stopping the demo, and in Triton's demos you can't even stop the damn things, get bent Triton's. Now this is where I'd say, if only games had better support like the demos had. But there's the thing, games aren't linear like demos, you have control over the game, and so different noises might be required at any given time. The card seems ill-suited to this task due to the nature in which things have to be uploaded to RAM. The performance loss there is rather jarring. It doesn't seem to go away with faster CPUs as much as maybe you'd think it should, because that isn't going to aid the slow RAM on the card at all, and also driver issues seem to get worse as you install the card in quicker machines, as well as those crunchy noises, so I'm not confident saying this thing ever really worked all that well outside of just this one job of running demos. Now that argument that I said I knew you had in your head, the whole why not set it up next to a sound blaster, yeah sure, but that's an absolute headache. You have more patience than I if you're going to do that. The problem is that both the Gus and the Sound Blaster will default to port 220. Now you can change these on either card, but a lot of games don't like using these cards at any other address. So all you'll end up with is a precarious, incompatible mess that was hard to set up. For the most part then, all this does is reinforce how useless the Gus was as a product in most fields. Because why would you buy a sound card that required you buying a second sound card just to get sound? You wouldn't, it's stupid, and the cost at the time would have been extremely prohibitive. I doubt if anybody really did this back then, aside from maybe a few people with more money and time than sense. Which, fair play to them, it's their property and their money, and hey, if you had fun doing it, then fair play to you, but it's not for me. I, I'm growing older and more impatient, I like to just plug things in and have them work. All in all, I do love the hardware, and I do like the idea behind it but I can't help but think we might just be better off with it dead and buried as it is today. They're not worth the hassle all the time unless you really want to run demo scene stuff on your system and don't mind paying the premium for it. There are some clones of the card around now as well that you might be able to get cheaper, but I doubt it. Anyway, that really is all I have to say. I hope you don't think I'm hating on this thing too much. Like I say, I kind of like it, but it's kind of useless and... Yeah, good ideas don't always turn out quite as good as they seem in your head. And I think this is one of those curses. Nonetheless, back to that toss pot in front of the camera. So there we go, that is a rather overrated and overpriced peripheral. It's kind of a shame really, because, you know, regardless of my criticisms, I do like the card. I'm quite fond of mine. And when it's used in the right way, it's certainly very capable. As we saw with uh, demo scene sort of things, it, it definitely it is better than a sound blaster for that. And that's the, the key point, when it's used the right way. I just don't think it lends itself well to games, and that's what most people want to do, and what most people would have tried to use it for in its time. If you're mad into the demo scene, then maybe it's worth having, but... At the time it was new, I don't think it was really a wise thing to, to obtain for most people. And I think the right thing to have done would be to buy a Sound Blaster 16 or a Pro Audio Spectrum 16, or if you were stuck for cash, a Sound Blaster Pro 2 or a clone of one would have done really well. In fact, Sound Blaster Pro 2s at that point were coming down in price, and it would have been perfectly usable for a good few yards. That would have actually been a good buy around then, I feel. So, yeah, this thing, I don't know, it just it doesn't really strike me as the best card. But there are some games that made good use of it, Epic's games, like uh, Jazz Jack Rabbit. But I don't really like that game very much, it always, always just felt really unrefined to me, and I don't enjoy it. Some people do, and, well, by all means enjoy it. It makes better use of the Gus than most. But you notice there's a lack of sound effects in that, it's not as obnoxious with them compared to a game like Sir Commander Keen, even that's fairly tame compared to some of them. And maybe that was a technical choice, because the Gust just doesn't work well in games. As we saw, the Sound Blaster 16, you'll get better performance, and it, it doesn't really make sense on the face of it, because the GF1 should be doing all the mixing in hardware. Which is about all it can do. And the Sound Blaster 16 can't do that. Mixing has to be done in software. At least for PCM. The, the thing is, the music doesn't. And I wonder if that's a factor. Because 
the FM synth, you know, has been mixed on the car. It's a very simple mixer. The Gus doesn't really have anything like that, you know, it needs a daughter board, but then everything's coming from the GF1, really, so, yeah, I don't know. I, f I feel it's quite inefficient. I almost wonder, I'd have to look at technical documentation, I wouldn't fully understand, so, theoretically, I wonder if maybe uploading samples pulls an interrupt down, and that makes the system have to work, and that's where the loss in performance is going. It's not like you have a DMA buffer loop like on the Sound Blaster. It's, it's quite easy to get sound to the Sound Blaster. I think it's probably easier than getting it to the Gus, but then some people say otherwise. Maybe it depends on how you're trying to do it. That could well be, but it's just, it doesn't work that great for, for games, I don't feel. These, obviously, as I said, some people will go down, oh, I'll use multiple sound cards, but I take issue with that. I mean, certainly in the card's time, that would just have been infeasible for most people. It, it wasn't a cheap accessory, and, you know, now you've got to buy two sound cards. Why the hell is it good as a sound card if I need another sound card to make it useful? That just seems silly. Nowadays, we don't have that issue, so, well, we do, because it's overpriced, but... At least the other cards, you can get another one cheaper than it would have been back then, I guess. But, uh, I have issues with that. I've tried doing it in the past, it never works well. And one reason is what I was on about with how different things want different interrupts and stuff all the time. So, what, do you have to move the other card every time as well? Sound Blasters use jumpers. Like, I don't want to be taking the lid off my system. And even if you find some balance, inevitably a lot of software is hard-coded to use certain resources on certain cards. So, you know, be like, well, I, I know this game I want to play, it needs the Gus at 220 and IRQ5 or whatever, fine. But now my Sound Blaster has to be at 240 on, like, IRQ7 or whatever, and that's not going to work in some other game. And it, it just isn't practical, so I'm always suspicious of people who say they're doing that and it's been fine, because they're just... I don't think it, it can be, it won't be in many cases. Not really worth it, and like I said, the, the only real use for the, the Gus I can think of is demo scene stuff. It doesn't work well in Windows, doesn't work well in games. Maybe it was better if you had the daughter card, but I've never really seen one in use. Maybe like the Gus Max or something would be better, but I doubt it. And even then, you know, those ones that support more RAM, that's stupid. I've never had anything need the whole one meg on this. Like, want more than that? I mean, I've had things that want the whole one meg. Never more than that. And I, I would imagine that's pretty much always the case. Because things that supported it would have wanted to support the the classic, because it's a uh, retronym. You know, it's, uh, so they only go up to a meg. And so they, things would have been written for that. It's, I don't know. I don't see the point in those. They're even more overpriced. Unless you're writing your own stuff for it, then you're going to use the memory, I suppose. You know, if you you write your own music and putting your own samples there, that are really big uh, for general use, not really necessary. And if you just want it as a, a MIDI wave table, it's a total waste because I don't think it's very good at that. Personally, it doesn't sound that great. It's not bad, but there's certainly better options if you want to splash out lots of money. Maybe something like a sound canvas would be a better choice. I don't like Roland Gear. I have issues with that all, you know, I don't like their sound set, and I don't think they necessarily were very well made, but they were supported very well by games, the sound canvas, and I have an SCC one, and I do use it, because whether I like the thing or not, it's useful. Lots of games supported it quite well, you know, it was... It was very good <laughs> MIDI playback, <laughs> and quite a few soundtracks were written for the sound canvas. So if you're going to spend a lot of money just to get MIDI wavetable, sound canvas may be a better option. It's pretty good at that. And this is, like I say, it's coming from someone who doesn't like Roland Gear. And interestingly, the sound canvas has a similar issue to the Gus, where if it's pushed a little bit too hard, it drags the system to its knees. And again, it, it seems like to be an issue with interrupts or something where it just hammers it and slows the system down. I think in the case of the, the SCC-1, it's more Roland probably just put an underpowered processor on it. Every Roland device I've ever had has been woefully underpowered in the CPU department. I can get Roland keyboards to lag. You know, every Roland keyboard I've ever used has lagged because the CPU's been underpowered. and It's pretty pathetic considering what they cost. Personally, 
for these older machines I've really I really like my Turtle Beach Maui it doesn't have any effects or anything I mean that's an advantage of the sound card you've got Revive and Chorus and you do have some other effects but not much used those and it's a bit of a bastard program compared to say uh, Yamaha uh, AWM2 device like the MU modules or the SW60 Good luck finding a working SW60. If you have more than one machine, maybe getting a module of some kind is better value for money because then you can take it to different machines instead of having to move a card. But yeah, I like my Turtle Beach Maui. That only does MIDI. It sounds like the Gus, but a little bit more punchy, to be honest. It's, uh, it's been pretty good. Or, again, you know, fancy sound cards. Terratech Maestro 3296. Hard to find. Also costs a lot of money, but... If you were going to buy a Gus, then, well, maybe the Maestro 3296 is a better choice. Works in more games, has a really good wavetable on it. The FM's a little bit so-so, but it is usable FM. It's not like the, the horrible sample-based thing that the Gus farts out. So, you know, there's plenty of alternatives uh, that are probably a better a better option if you really want to, you know, just splooge money on, the, on a problem that maybe didn't exist to begin with. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. Uh, you know, that's it's up to you at the end of the day. I own one because I bought it when they didn't cost a lot yet. I wouldn't buy one again now, but if you do want one that badly, I would totally understand it because it is it is a part of history as far as sound cards go. You know, it is relevant in that regard, and it is a pretty neat piece of hardware. Like I say, it's. When it's used properly, it is pretty cool, and it is certainly capable, it's just, it doesn't have much practical use. So, moving on. What are we going to do next time? I don't know. I'd like to look at something a bit newer, but then I might not, because my plans have, have ways of not going accordingly. And I might be getting myself something new to play with, so maybe that will be next, but probably not. So I'm not sure. But we'll see what happens. We could just look at the machine the Gravis was in. I might actually do that while it's out. Because I'm only going to put it away again. I don't need it right now. But it's a bit of an oddball machine. So maybe we could maybe we could take a quick look at it. Just, you know. So, someone's going to be curious about it. Because it's a bit, a bit unusual, isn't it? Seeing a, a Socket 4 machine like that. I mean, I just built out of hardware I wasn't using. It's like, none of this is doing it. It's all the weird hardware that that's, you know, a little bit flaky. We'll just throw it in a case and you know we'll have this total freak of a machine this clown car uh, i prefer my pentium 66 it's much more useful but this thing's fun and then there's the something newer is maybe maybe a bit odd in its own right but i guess we'll get there don't really have much else to say I, i'm sure i did i'll put it on after the uh the thingy with the text and the eye and, and cz1 noises that come on after I've always said, you know, that I'm high treason, thanks for watching, and until next time, remember, don't be a screw up, load DOS 622 up, or else. I guess I do have this to add, that given how I've seen things go in the past, it's going to be pretty interesting to see if some people get butt hurt down in the comments because I dare to criticise like the mighty Gravis ultrasound. Well, you know, that's far play. People can have their opinions, but I mean, you know, <laughs> it's not very useful, is it? Let's be honest. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, that, that is just the, the nature of things. I'm sorry, and I'm sorry I've made you mad. Actually, I'm not. Fuck you. Grow up. You, you need to you need to get a grip on reality, I'm afraid, if it means that much to you. So, you know, <laughs> ain't my problem. That's a you problem. You decided to get upset. You can live with the consequences of that. I'm just going to go out my day. Actually, I'm hungry. I think I'm going to have a pot noodle now. Assuming I have some left. Oh, excellent. I do. Cool. Yeah. Fuck. Hey, there's no expiry date printed on this one. That must mean it never goes out of date. That's good. I'm going to go and eat it now. And somebody else can worry about getting mad at things. I'm out of here. I'm starving. <laughs>
this isn't sponsored by pot noodle. Actually, they, they're pretty shit now because they don't have as much salt in them. <laughs> they're crap. They used to be a bit less crap years ago. They've gotten crappier.